Shall we pray? Father in heaven, as we open your holy word to study Revelation chapter 20 and verse 12, we ask for the guidance of your spirit. Take away all preconceived notions that we might hear your voice. Thank you for the promise of your presence, and we claim that promise in the name of Jesus. Amen. The misinterpreted verse that we will study today is Revelation chapter 20 and verse 12, where we find a description of the millennial judgment of the wicked or of the unsaved. Let's read the verse first of all, Revelation 20 and verse 12. Remember, this is taking place during the millennium, during the thousand years. Here John in vision says, And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. So you notice here in Revelation chapter 20 and verse 12, it speaks about the dead standing before God, and the dead are judged according to what is written in the books. Now this verse is describing the judgment that takes place during the thousand years. Revelation chapter 20 and verse 5 tells us explicitly that the wicked dead do not live again until after the thousand years. So now we have a problem. How can the wicked dead stand before God during the thousand years, if they don't come to life again until the end of the thousand years. You understand the dilemma here. Well, this is what we want to take a closer look at. Those who believe in the immortality of the soul claim that the souls of the dead that stand before God in judgment are these individuals that are mentioned in this verse. However, the text does not say the souls of the dead stand before God. The text says the dead stand before God. The text says the dead were judged by what is written in the books. Notice that it's not the souls of the dead, it is the dead who stand before God. Nevertheless, we need to ask the question, how can dead people stand before God? Do we need to say that, they, that it's the soul that stands before God to kind of reconcile this verse with other parts of Scripture? I believe that the answer to that question is no. Now, in order to understand this verse, we need to review the information that we've studied previously, the three-step process of the pre-advent investigative judgment. So let's review who, when, where, and how the judgment transpires before the second coming of Christ with the righteous. Then we're going to take a look at the fact that the judgment has three stages. So in other words, the judgment process has three uh, steps, and the judgment has also three stages. You'll understand this as we move along. So let's ask first of all, when is the judgment? I'm talking about the judgment of the righteous now. It is before the second coming of Christ. You say, how do we know that? Well, let's go to Revelation chapter 14 and verses 6 and 7. Here John, describing something that he saw in vision, says, Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment has come, and worship Him who made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and springs of water. Two things that I want to mention here in this verse. First of all, 
the everlasting gospel is being preached to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. And then we find that it says that the hour of God's judgment has come. So you'll notice that the judgment begins while the gospel is being preached. This means that the judgment must take place before the second coming of Christ, before the prob close of probation, actually. So what I want us to notice from Revelation 14, 6, and 7 is that the judgment of the righteous begins before the second coming of Christ while the door of probation is still open and the gospel is being preached. Now the next question we want to answer is where does this judgment take place? Does it take place in heaven or does it take place on earth? The Bible tells us explicitly that this judgment before the second coming occurs in heaven. Notice Daniel chapter 7 verses 9 and 10. Daniel 7, 9 and 10. I watched till thrones were put in place, and the Ancient of Days was seated. This is happening in heaven. The Ancient of Days lives in heaven. We pray, Our Father which art in heaven. It continues describing His garments. His garment was white as snow, and the hair of His head was like pure wool. His throne was a fiery flame, its wheels a burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before Him. A thousand thousands ministered to Him. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood before Him. Those are the angels, and the angels live in heaven. Then we're told at the end of verse 10, the court was seated and the books were opened. So where does this judgment take place? This judgment takes place in heaven, where the Ancient of Days is, where the angels are. That is where the court is seated and the books are opened for examination. Now who is judged in this pre-advent judgment that takes place in heaven? 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 10 tells us who is judged during this stage. Notice 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 10. It reads as follows, For we, remember Paul is writing to the Corinthian church, he's writing to Christians, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. So notice, the Apostle Paul writing to, to the Corinthians says, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ to render an account for what we did in the body. That means while we lived on this earth, whether what we did was good or whether what we did was bad. Ellen White, in the Great Controversy, page 483, wrote some interesting words. As the books of record are opened in the judgment, she's describing this judgment before the second coming, listen carefully now, the lives of all who have believed on Jesus come in review before God. So who is judged in this pre-advent investigative judgment? It's not everybody on planet earth. It is all those who have claimed to believe in Jesus. So Ellen White is in harmony with 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 10. So once again, as the books of record are opened in the judgment, the lives of all who have believed on Jesus come in review before God. Beginning with those who first lived upon the earth, that means that would be Adam, uh, the person with which God starts the judgment, our advocate presents the cases of each successive generation and closes with the living. So the judgment takes place in chronological order, beginning with Adam, who first repented and believed on Jesus, continuing with the dead throughout the course of human history, and ending with those who are alive just before the close of probation. Now, there's something very important that we need to realize, and that is that believers do not appear in person in this heavenly judgment. Obviously, they can't appear in person. Dead people can't appear in person before the judgment seat of Christ. So how do the righteous who are judged before the second coming appear before God? Well, first of all, we need to notice that the Bible teaches that believers as well as unbelievers who die are not in heaven or in hell, they are in the grave. Notice John chapter 5 verses 28 and 29. 
Here Jesus is speaking and He says, Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves, where are the dead folks? The dead are not in heaven or in hell, the dead are in their graves. All who are in the graves will hear His voice and come forth. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life, by the way, those uh, cases of the ones who come forth in the resurrection of life have been examined before the second coming of Christ. And then it says, and those who have done evil to the resurrection of damnation, they resurrect after the thousand years. Now the righteous then do not appear before God's judgment seat before the second coming in person. They appear there through the record of their lives. We could say the hard drive or the DVD that contains the record of their lives. Notice once again the Great Controversy, page 482. Here Ellen White wrote, The righteous dead will not be raised until after the judgment, at which they are accounted worthy of the resurrection of life. Hence, they will not be present in person at the tribunal when their records are examined and their cases decided. Now there's a passage uh, in the Gospels that clearly tells us that the righteous will not be there in person when their name comes up in the judgment. Notice Matthew chapter 22 and verses 11 to 13. Now before I read those verses, I need to give you the context, the previous context to what I'm going to read in those verses. Matthew 22, 1 through 14 contains a parable that was told by Jesus Christ. And in the parable, a first call is given to the Jewish nation to come to the wedding, the wedding of Jesus with His people. Well, the first call is rejected. Then we're told in the parable that oxen and fatted cattle are killed. This is a reference to the death of Christ. The first call is before the death of Christ. The second call comes after the oxen and fatted cattle have been killed, which symbolize the death of Jesus Christ on the cross. So after Jesus' death, a second call is given for the Jewish nation to come to the wedding but they reject the second invitation to the wedding as well. And so then the story continues by saying that the king was angry at them, so he sent his armies and the city of Jerusalem was destroyed. That's in the year 70. So we have moved from before the coming of Christ, the call to the Jewish nation to prepare for the wedding, then Jesus dies, a second invitation goes out, the invitation is rejected as well, and then, as a result, the city of Jerusalem is destroyed in the year 70. And so then the gospel goes to the highways and byways. In other words, now the gospel is going to go to the Gentiles. And multitudes of Gentiles are gathered in the wedding chamber. Now you say, how could they be gathered in the wedding chamber? They're living in the Roman Empire. Well, they're gathered in the wedding chamber because their names are up there and because the record of their lives is up there. And so now we're going to read the verses in chapter 22 and verses 11 to 13. There is going to be an examination of all of those who are in the wedding chamber, not in person, but through the record of their lives. Notice what we find in verse 11. But when the king, king came to see, a better translation is he came in to examine the guests. He didn't only come to look at them. The, the word that is used in Greek means to scrutinize or to examine. In other words, this is the judgment. The king comes in to examine the guests. The guests are not there. The guests are on earth. They accepted the invitation to the wedding, but they are in heaven only through the record of their lives. So the king came in to see the guests. And he saw a man there who did not have on a wedding garment, which represents the righteousness of Christ. So he said to him, Friend, how did you come in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the servants, Bind him hand and foot, 
take him away and cast him into outer darkness, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now this cannot be happening after the second coming of Christ. You say, how do we know this doesn't take place after the second coming of Christ? Well, it's very simple. After the second coming, when Jesus takes his people to heaven, is he then going to examine everyone that went to heaven? He's going to say, oh, how did you make it in here to heaven? Of course not. This examination takes place before the second coming of Christ. It's the pre-advent judgment. God's people are not there in person. God's people are there through their records, and their records are examined there in the heavenly court. By the way, at this point the wedding has not yet taken place. The invited guests to the wedding are all in the chamber through the record of their lives, but the wedding hasn't taken place. In fact, the wedding between Christ and His people takes place before the second coming of Christ. And then He comes to get His people. You say, now pastor, what are you talking about? Let's go to Luke chapter 12, verses 35 to 37. You see, all of the guests are those who accept the gospel invitation. They are written in the book of life in heaven. Their records are in the books. And before the second coming, during probation, when their case comes up, their life is examined. They're not there in person, they're there through their records. Notice Luke 12, 35 to 37. Here Jesus says to His disciples, to His followers, Let your waist be girded, and your lamps burning, and you yourselves, listen carefully now, you yourselves be like men who wait for their master when he will return from the wedding. Excuse me, he's telling his disciples, you, be, you wait until your master returns from the wedding. So in other words, the disciples are not there for the wedding, but they are there in the sense that their records are up there. So it says, and you yourselves be like men who wait for their master when he will return from the wedding, that when he comes and knocks, they may open to him immediately. Blessed are those servants whom the master, when he comes, will find watching. Assuredly, I say to you that he will gird himself and have them sit down to eat and will come and serve them. That's the wedding reception. God's people will be in heaven for the wedding reception. They are there only through their records in uh, the wedding itself. Now this is a concept that many people don't understand, but it's, it's very, very biblical. Now, we notice that after the examination is done, Every case has been decided, then probation will close and a verdict will be pronounced. So you have the investigation and now you're going to have the verdict. Revelation chapter 22 and verse 11 has the verdict based on the examination in the heavenly court. It says, He who is unjust, let him be unjust still. That word still is interesting. In other words, this person's case isn't going to change. He who is filthy, let him be filthy still. He who is righteous, let him be righteous still. He who is holy, let him be holy still. So you'll notice here that this is the final verdict that is pronounced when all of the cases have been examined and Jesus now marries His people, marries His kingdom, the totality of His people. But Jesus has not yet come to pick up His people. That happens at the second coming when He comes to reward His people. In fact, the very next verse after Revelation 22, 11 is when Jesus actually comes and brings His reward to take His people to heaven. Notice Revelation chapter 22 and verse 12. Immediately after saying, He who is unjust, let him be unjust still. He who is filthy, let him be filthy still. He who is righteous, let him be righteous still. He that is holy, let him be holy still. Then it says, Jesus is speaking, and behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me to give to everyone according to his work. This is confirmed in Matthew chapter 16, verse 27, where Jesus said, For the Son of Man will come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and now notice, and then he will reward each according to his works. So in other words, when Jesus comes, He brings the reward. But in order to bring the reward, He would have had to determine the reward beforehand in the heavenly investigative judgment. Now some people say, well, Pastor Bohr, why in the world 
would uh, God judge Christians? Why would believers come up for their cases to be examined in the judgment? Very simple, folks, because not all person, all persons who claim to be Christians are true believers. You see, the church has wheat and tares. The church has wise and foolish virgins. The church uh, has good and bad fish. The church has people who cry out, Lord, Lord, Jesus says, I never knew you. The church has people who have the form of godliness, but don't have the power of godliness. And so the purpose of this pre-advent judgment is to sift between true believers and counterfeit believers, those who said, Lord, Lord, and those who lived by the will of the Lord. Now let's go to Revelation chapter 6, verses 14 through 17. Revelation chapter 6, verses 14 through 17. This is describing the second coming of Jesus Christ. It says in Revelation chapter 6, verse 14, then the sky receded as a scroll when it is rolled up. And every mountain and island, listen carefully now of the expression, was moved out of its place. And the kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men, every slave and every free man, hid themselves in the caves and in the rocks of the mountains, and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us! and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne. So notice the details. The sky receded as a scroll. It's rolled up. Uh, every island and mountain is moved out of its place. Then a, a, th a throne is seen, and somebody is sitting on the throne. So once again, uh, verse 16, And said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us, and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath has come, and who is able to stand? Now, later on in Revelation, the second coming is described again. Notice Revelation chapter 20 and verse 11, and please follow the sequence. The order of events here is extremely important. Revelation 20, 11 is describing the same event that we just read about in Revelation chapter 6 and verses 14 through 17. Revelation chapter 20 and verse 11 says, Then I saw a great white throne, and him who sat on it, See, like in Revelation 6, you have a throne and someone is sitting on the throne. And notice what it continues saying, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. That's a detail that we also notice in Revelation chapter 6, verses 14 through 17. And it says, no place was found for the earth and heaven because they had fled away. Revelation 20 verse 11 is describing the second coming of Jesus Christ just like Revelation 6 verses 14 through 17. Now at the second coming, all of the wicked will die. The wicked will be destroyed. Revelation 19, the last verse of Revelation 19 verse 21 says that all of the wicked will die at the second coming of Christ and they will remain dead during the thousand years. However, the righteous dead at the second coming will resurrect to receive their reward. And then they will be taken to heaven to perform a work of judgment. It's known as the millennial judgment. Let's go to Revelation chapter 20 and verses 4 through 6 where this millennial judgment is described. Revelation 20 verses 4 through 6. I saw thrones and they sat on them. That is the righteous who resurrect. And judgment was committed to them. Don't forget that. Judgment was committed to them. In other words, they were given the, the capacity and the task to judge. And uh, who are they going to judge? We'll see that in a few moments. Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and the word of God, and who had not worshipped the beast or his image, and had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands. And they lived... So they must have been dead before and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. And then it says in verse five, but the rest of the dead, which is the wicked, did not live again until the thousand years were finished. Now, several important things in this verse. First of all, the righteous resurrect uh, at the second coming of Christ. Then a work of judgment is committed to them. Then John sees 
it says the souls of those who had been beheaded for the witness of Jesus and the word of God had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received his mark on their foreheads. Those are the martyrs that will die in the second stage of martyrs that we talked about in a previous presentation. They live at the very end of human history just before the close of probation. You say, how do we know that? Because we're told here that they did not worship the beast or his image or receive the mark. That is something that happens at the very end of time, just before the close of probation. And notice that these souls are not alive in heaven praising the Lord. These souls actually were dead. Twice we're told this. It says here, they lived. So if the souls lived, they must have died. They must have been dead. And then we find uh, once again, uh, uh, this is repeated twice that the souls were dead. Now, let's go and talk about the millennial judgment. We've already talked about the pre-advent judgment. Only believers are judged at that time to sift between the genuine and the counterfeit. Then we noticed that at the end of this judgment, all cases are decided and probation closes. Then we notice that Jesus comes with His reward and He resurrects the dead and the living righteous, He will take to heaven for a thousand years. And then during the thousand years you have what is called the millennial judgment. In the first part of the lesson today, we discussed the investig investigative judgment of the righteous before the second coming of Jesus. Now we're going to notice that God follows the same process, the same steps during the millennial judgment. There are three phases. Number one, an examination of the evidence. Number two, the pronouncing of the sentence. And number three, the execution of the sentence. We notice that in the pre-advent judgment. Pre-advent judgment, every case of the believers is examined. Then God pronounces, he who is righteous, let him be righteous still. He who is filthy, let him be filthy still. And then Jesus gives the reward when he comes. The same three-step process takes place with the wicked during the millennium. Let's read Revelation chapter 20 and verse 4 once again. And I saw thrones and they sat on them, and judgment was committed to them, that is to the righteous who resurrected. Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus, for the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast or his image, and had not received his mark on their foreheads. This is the last group of martyrs right before the close of probation. And it continues saying, they lived because they had been killed during the final tribulation, they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. As I mentioned before, this group that is given a work of judgment, to whom is committed a work of judgment, are the second group of martyrs of Revelation 6, 9 to 11. And you need to go back and you need to study that particular presentation because we don't have time to do it now. It's titled, The Souls Under the Altar. Now this group of martyrs live during a short period of time, just before the close of probation, they will receive the latter rain power of the Holy Spirit. They will proclaim the loud cry of Revelation 18 verses 1 through 5. And they will refuse to worship the beast and the image or to receive the mark. And as a result, they will die a martyr's death. However, something very important we need to remember. And that is that these are not the only ones that are going to perform a work of judgment during the thousand years. Now, Revelation 20 verse 4 says that they performed the work of judgment during the thousand years. It doesn't say that they exclusively were the ones that were performing the work of judgment. Actually, all believers who are in heaven after the second coming during the millennium will be involved in this judgment. You say, well, how do you know that? Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verses 1 to 3. Here the Apostle Paul is writing to Christians, to the Corinthian church. Dare any of you, Corinthians, having a matter against another, go to law before the unrighteous and not before the saints? In other words, are you suing your fellow Christians before secular courts? Verse 2, do you not know that the saints, that's the righteous, will judge the world? And the world means the wicked. And if the world will be judged by you, what is Paul saying? The Corinthians are going to judge the world. If the world is to be judged by you, 
Are you unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Do you not know that we, Paul is saying, me as well as the Corinthian church, and by extension all Christians who are saved, do you not know that we shall judge angels? How much more things that pertain to this life? It is during the millennial judgment that the rest of the dead will stand before God. The text that we read from Revelation chapter 20 and verse 12. However, the incisive question remains, who are the dead who stand before God during the thousand years? They certainly cannot be the righteous, because God judged them before the second coming and resurrected them at the second coming. Therefore, the rest of the dead who are judged during the thousand years must be the wicked who lived before the second coming and who were slain at the second coming of Christ. And now we ask the question, how can wicked dead people stand before God during the millennium if they don't live again till after the millennium? In short, how can dead people stand before God? Those who believe in the immortality of the soul claim that the souls of the dead stand before God. However, we shall find that that is not what the text is saying. They are judged by the records in heaven, not because their souls are there personally. Let's read Revelation 20 and verse 12 once again. And I saw the dead. He doesn't say dead souls. He says, I saw the dead. So the wicked here are dead. They're not living. I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God. How can a dead person stand before God? Let's continue reading. And books were opened. Ah, that's how the dead stand before God, through the record of their lives. And books were opened. And another book was opened, which we know is the book of life, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged. Notice it doesn't say the souls were judged. It says the dead were judged according to their works by the things which are written in the books. How do the dead stand before God? Folks, let's not be dishonest and say that it's the souls of the dead that are standing before God. No, it is the dead through their records in heaven that are examined during the thousand years. Now, in order to fully understand this, we need to review something that we studied before. The expanded meaning of the word spirit. So let's examine this. We saw in our previous lesson, the run right before this, that with the passing of time, the spirit or character of man is fully developed as we live along. The spirit is more than just the breath of life. The spirit of an individual is also the record that that person developed during the course of his life. When Jesus comes, he will not only resurrect the bodies of the saints, he will also give them the breath of life, and along with the breath of life, Jesus is going to give them who they were at the moment they died. In other words, he will return with the breath of life, with the spirit, if you please. He will give them back their self-identity, which he has preserved in the heavenly books. Let's review this concept to help us understand how the dead stand before God during the thousand years. Let's go to Ecclesiastes chapter 12 and verse 7. Then the dust will return to the earth as it was, this is at death, and the Spirit will return to God who gave it. So notice when a person dies, their body goes back to the dust and their spirit returns to God. Now the spirit is more, just, more than just the breath. The record of their lives is complete. The book is closed, in other words. During the millennium, God will bring to view the life record of the wicked while they are still dead. This is the sense in which the dead stand before God. The books contain an exact transcript, that is their spirit, of their unrepentant lives. The records were made while they were alive, but they are examined after they are dead. Let's read Revelation chapter 20 and verse 12. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God. 
and books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. In other words, that's their spirit in an extended sense. It is the record of their lives. It is their self-identity, the history that they wrote while they were living. Now, several Bible texts corroborate this expanded concept of the word spirit. Let's begin first, and we've studied this before in the previous lecture. Many people might not have heard that one, and those who heard this will be good review. In Luke 8, verse 55, we have the record of the resurrection of Jairus' daughter. Everybody was crying because she had died. Notice Luke 8, verse 55, and let's read carefully. There's a personal pronoun here, a possessive personal pronoun. It says in Luke 8, 55, when Jesus resurrected her, then her spirit returned, and she arose immediately, and he commanded that she be given something to eat. What was returned to this little girl when she was resurrected by Christ? When she died, she breathed her last, and her record was complete up to that point. When Jesus resurrected her, she picked up exactly where she had left off. Did she recognize her parents? Of course. She was probably hungry when she died, because the first thing they do is give her food. Now let's notice another place where the word spirit is used. The martyrdom of Stephen. Notice Acts chapter 7 and verses 59 and 60. Acts 7, 59 and 60. Speaking of the stoning of Stephen, it says the following. And they stoned Stephen as he was calling on God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Notice he doesn't say receive the spirit. It says receive my spirit. You see, the spirit of Stephen is not my spirit. The record of his life is not the record of my life. Each of us have our own self-identity. We have written our own biographical record, if you please. So it says, and they stoned Stephen as he was calling on God, saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he knelt down and cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not charge them with this sin. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. I just love the way that this says, he fell asleep. <laughs> you know, if a person goes to sleep, they're going to wake up. So the implication is that Stephen, yeah, he went to sleep, but you know, he's going to sleep for a long time. But when Jesus comes, he's going to wake up. Let's notice one further example, the case of Jesus Christ. Luke chapter 23 and verse 46. Luke 23 and verse 46. This is speaking about the death of Jesus on the cross. And when Jesus had cried out with a loud voice, he said, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Possess a pronoun. His spirit was not anybody else's spirit in the sense of his life record. So he says, into your hands I commend my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last. In other words, he gave up the vital force. In all these cases, folks, God not only returned to the person resurrected their breath or their vital force, he also returned to them the individuality of each. This is the reason why the Apostle Paul wrote in two different ways. The Apostle Paul could write, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you, or he could write, Brethren, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Because the spirit is you. In other words, your, your record is who you are. Your character is who you are. By the way, if you want the references, 1 Thessalonians 5.28 says, The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. In Galatians 6 verse 18, the Apostle Paul writes, Brethren, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. Now, Ellen White understood this. You know, Ellen White had two and a half years of primary education. Many people are critical of her, but she understood this concept that the Bible presents. Notice this statement that we find in the Seventh-day Adventist Bible Commentary. We've read this before in our previous lecture. Our personal identity is preserved in the resurrection. What is preserved? Our personal identity though not the same particles of matter or material substance as went into the grave. The wondrous works of God are a mystery to man. And now comes the key portion. The spirit, comma, 
the character, comma, is returned to God. So what is the Spirit? It's the character of the person, who the person is, the record of their lives. The Spirit, the character, is returned to God, there to be preserved. What is it that God preserves in heaven? In the heavenly books, in the written books? It's the life of the person. She continues, In the resurrection every man will have his own character. God in His own time will call forth the dead, giving again the breath of life, and bidding the dry bones live. The same form will come forth, but it will be free from disease and every defect. It lives again, bearing the same individuality of features, so that friend will recognize friend. There is no law of God in nature that shows that God gives back the same identical particles of matter that compose the body before death. God shall give the righteous dead a body that will please Him. Therefore, we have the answer to our question. The fact is that the wicked dead stand before God in the same way that the righteous dead stood before God before the second coming of Christ. They stand there through the record of their lives. In that way is uh, that the dead stand before God during the millennial judgment. But now we need to examine the post-millennial judgment. You see there's a judgment after the millennium as well, and it follows the three steps of the pre-advent judgment and of the millennial judgment. There's an examination, there's a pronouncing of a sentence, and then there's the execution of the sentence. By the way, that's our system of jurisprudence in the world today. In the Western world anyway, there's always an examination of the evidence, it's called the trial. At the end of the trial, based on the evidence, there's a verdict, and then at the end of the verdict, then comes a time when the verdict is implemented or executed. Now let's notice the post-millennial judgment. After the thousand years, the earth and the sea will give up the dead that are in them. That's important. After the thousand years, the earth and the sea will give up the dead that are in them. That means that the dead are going to resurrect. They're going to live again, according to Revelation 20, verse 5. Now, whereas during the thousand years, the dead stood before God through their records, the dead, after the millennium, resurrect and stand before God in person. They will then be able to see the reason why they are outside the holy city, and they will agree that God was right in the decision that He made. You say, how do you know this? Well, did you notice that in Revelation chapter 20, verse 11, we have a reference to the second coming? Revelation chapter 12 tells us that during the millennium, the dead stand before God through their records. Then verse 13 speaks about the resurrection of the wicked after the thousand years. So you have the second coming of Christ, then after the second coming, the judgment of the dead who stand before God, and then in verse 13 you have the, um, the resurrection of the wicked after the thousand years. Let's read Revelation 20 verse 13. The sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, this is the wicked, the rest of the dead, and they were judged, each one according to his works. So notice, at this point, the sea is giving up the dead in it, and death and Hades, the word Hades is the grave, delivered up the dead who were in them. This is the resurrection of the wicked after the thousand years. What does the expression, the sea gave up the dead, and death and Hades delivered up the dead? What does that mean? Let's go to Isaiah 20, uh, 26 and verse 19. Isaiah 26 and verse 19. It says here, speaking of the resurrection, here it's talking about the resurrection of the righteous, but in principle it applies as well to the resurrection of the wicked. It says in Isaiah 26 verse 19, Your dead shall live, together with my dead body they shall arise. Awake, if they have to awake, well they must have been asleep before, right? Awake and sing, you who dwell in the dust, in other words those who are dead, for your dew is like the dew of herbs, and the earth shall cast out the dead. So notice the expression in Revelation 20 verse 13. The sea gave up the dead. Death and Hades delivered up the dead. 
Here it says, the earth shall cast out the dead. So verse 13 is referring to the resurrection of the wicked after the thousand years. Ellen White described the resurrection of the wicked. By the way, are the wicked going to receive the, their life record once again after the thousand years when they resurrect? In other words, are the wicked going to resurrect wicked? Or suddenly do the wicked re resurrect righteous? Does Alexander the Great resurrect still as Alexander the Great? Does Nero resurrect as Nero? Of course they will, because when they resurrect they not only get the breath of life, but along with the breath of life, along with their spirit, they get their life record, their terrible life record. Notice Ellen White described this in Great Controversy, page 664. Speaking of those who are outside the holy city, there are kings and generals who conquered nations, valiant men who never lost a battle, proud, ambitious warriors whose approach made kingdoms tremble. In death, these experience no change. Once you die, your record is complete, and that's what you're going to get back. Of course, minus everything that God deletes in the case of the, those who are truly righteous in the pre-advent investigative judgment. We studied that in our last presentation. But this is talking about the wicked. In death, these experience no change. As they come up from the grave, they resume. What does resume mean? It means they start again. They resume the current of their thoughts just where it ceased. So God not only returns the capacity to breathe, He also returns to them the precise moment where they left off. They are actuated, she continues, by the same desire to conquer that ruled them when they fell. So now they are going to see the evidence of their lives. Once again, there is going to be a trial, and God is going to reveal before all of the wicked their entire life, and why they're outside the holy city, why they're lost. God cares that everybody knows that He acted correctly. He does a pre-advent judgment to convince the heavenly beings that He did everything just right, and He has a right to take the righteous to heaven. During the thousand years, He convinces the righteous who are in heaven judging that He was correct in leaving all of those outside that will be outside the city behind. And after the thousand years, God will even convince the wicked that He has acted right in their case. Ellen White wrote in Great Controversy, uh, interesting page, Great Controversy page 666, you're never going to forget that number, as soon as the books of record are opened, and the eye of Jesus looks upon the wicked, they are conscious of every sin which they have ever committed. They see just where their feet diverge from the path of purity and holiness, just how far pride and rebellion have carried them in the violation of the law of God. The seductive temptations which they encouraged by indulgence in sin, the blessings perverted, the messengers of God despised, the warnings rejected, the waves of mercy beaten back by the stubborn, unrepentant heart, all appear as if written in letters of fire. And then all of the wicked will confess, True and just are your ways, O God. They will recognize that their sentence is just. It won't be like uh, many of the prisoners that go to jail today or prison. Uh, they say, I'm not guilty. I didn't do it. No, after the thousand years, the evidence will be so overwhelming that even the wicked will confess that the ways of God are true and just. And then what will God do? Then we're told that He will destroy death and the grave in the lake of fire. Notice Revelation chapter 20 and verses 14 and 15. Revelation 20, 14 and 15. It says, Then death and Hades, Hades is the grave. Later on in this series, I'm going to do a full presentation on the meaning of the word Hades and its equivalent Hebrew word Sheol. So stay tuned. Continue watching these presentations. An entire 
lecture is going to be on two words, one in Hebrew, Sheol, and the other one in Greek, Hades, and Hades appears 12 times in the New Testament. We're going to examine each one of the references, and we're going to see that really the word Hades means the grave. So it says, death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death, and anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. So in other words, second death is when death and uh, the grave are thrown into the lake of fire, and that's it. There's not going to be any more death. Now let's look at second death just for a moment. If there's a second death, well there must be a first death, right? So let's talk first about the righteous. The righteous were born from their mother, that's the first life we might say. Then they live their life, at the end of their life they die. That's the first death. When Jesus comes, because they were righteous, Jesus resurrects them, and they don't suffer death anymore, they live forever. With the wicked it's different. You see, the wicked, they also were born from their mothers for their first life, and they lived wicked lives. At the end of their wicked life, their case was irreversible. And so when Jesus uh, the set, comes the, after the millennium, uh, from heaven to earth with the new Jerusalem and with the righteous, then the wicked will resurrect. They will resurrect for their second life, if you please, or the continuation of the life that they lived before their first death. And then, after the judgment, they will suffer second death. So the righteous suffer one death, the wicked suffer two deaths. The first death, which is a physical death, and ultimately eternal death, from which, from which there will be no resurrection. And then we find in Revelation chapter 21 and verse 1, the wonderful news. After death and Hades are destroyed, we're told, now I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also, there was no more sea. And so the controversy will be ended. God will have convinced the righteous that he was right. God will have convinced all of the heavenly beings that he was right. God will have convinced all of the wicked that he was right. The entire universe will be in harmony that God is just and true and loving. Only then can God destroy sin and sinners and create a new heavens and a new earth where righteousness dwells. Now in closing, let me give you one further biblical example about how this three-step process of the judgment takes place. Folks, there are so many other places in Scripture that I could go to to show that God does a three-step judgment. An examination, sentencing, and the execution of the sentence. Let me give you a notable biblical example among many others that I could present. You remember the story of Daniel chapter 5. In Daniel chapter 5, King Belshazzar was trampling upon the holiness of God. He took the holy vessels from the temple of Jerusalem that Nebuchadnezzar had brought when he had conquered the city of Jerusalem, and he had a banquet where he invited 1,000 VIPs. And instead of using cups, common cups that they use in those days, he took the holy cups from the temple, and he used them to pour in fermented wine. And when uh, he was somewhat drunk with the wine, it says there in Daniel chapter 5, Belshazzar uh, drank from these cups, and he couldn't see straight. And so then we find something very interesting happening. A finger appears and begins to write on the wall of the palace. What was written on the wall of the palace by that finger? Well, this is the examination part of the judgment of Babylon. Daniel, when he interprets the handwriting on the wall, tells Belshazzar, listen carefully, you have been weighed in the balances and have been found wanting. What does that mean? You have been weighed in the balances. 
God is saying, your case has been examined and you've gone too far. In other words, your case is irreversible. I have weighed you in the balances, that's the way of saying, I have judged you, and by the evidence that I've examined, you have been found wanting. That is, uh, that is the examination. By the way, the examination is you have been weighed in the balances. But what was determined by weighing him in the balances? Here you have the second step. And you have been found what? Wanting. So you have, first of all, the examination. Then, based on the examination, you have the verdict. You have been found wanting. And then what is the next step? The next step is that that very night, the sentence was executed. Because that very night, Belshazzar was killed, and the kingdom was given to the Medes and the Persians. Are you seeing here this three-step process? God says, I've weighed you in the balances. In other words, I have judged you. I have judged the kingdom of Babylon. And based on the examination, on, based on what I've seen, you have been found wanting. The verdict is that you have been found wanting based on the evidence. And then, that very night, because he was found wanting, the sentence is executed. Belshazzar is killed, and the kingdom of Babylon falls. That's the way that God operates. And by the way, our system of jurisprudence in the Western world follows this same three-step process. An individual is not punished before a trial before a jury or a judge gives a verdict based on the evidence. And then the sentence is executed upon the person. So isn't it wonderful the way God operates? God operates in a very kind way and a very reasonable way. So what is meant in Revelation chapter 20 and verse 12 that the dead stood before God? It simply means that they stood there through the record of their lives. How do the righteous stand before God before the second coming of Jesus? How are their garments examined? They're examined in heaven, and they're examined through the record of their lives. And then after the thousand years, the wicked, as we've seen, will see the record of their lives, and they will pronounce that God is just and true in all His ways. The Bible says that every knee will bow, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So we must examine these Bible verses carefully. We can't just say, oh, see, the dead were standing before God. That must be their souls. No, 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 no. That's not the way we study the Bible. We compare one verse with the other, look at the context, study the terms, and then reach our conclusions. I hope you've understood the message. May God bless you and keep you in His care. <music> 